Our friend Professor Richard Wolf, the economist, the co-founder of Democracy at Work.info, the author of numerous books, his latest, The Sickness is the System, When Capitalism Fails to Save Us from Pandemics or Itself. R.D. Wolf with two Fs dot com as well. Prof. Wolf with two Fs on uh, Twitter is his Twitter handle. And uh, Professor Wolf, uh, we're, we're hearing, you know, increasingly, in, in particularly in light of the possibility that Donald might be indicted, um, that, you know, some of the real diehard Trump humpers out there are talking about a, a second civil war and we're locked and loaded and we're ready to go. And there's a lot of this rhetoric going on, which, uh, you know, raises an interesting question. Um, it, it, Donald Trump largely, I mean, he campaigned mostly on racism. I suppose in 2016, but he also campaigned on economics. Said he was going to bring our jobs home from China. He was going to raise wages. He was, you know, he, he was lying about all those things. But you know, he, he was talking the talk, um, kind of Bernie talk, which causes me to wonder what role have economics played? I know that there was a huge economic role. You know, the Panic of 1857 that led to the Civil War. Um, the Panic of 1771 that arguably led to the American Revolution, or at least the Boston Tea Party. Um, but historically, in other nations and states, what role does economics play in politics, and particularly in the, in the politics of major upheavals? Well, I think the, the short answer is that the role of economics is crucial, very important, deeply significant phrases like that. And I don't think it'll be any different now. Um, I think already the talk that you referred to, which is, in my mind, getting stronger as, as time goes by, um, is itself a reflection. I mean, he, here's the basic reality as I see it. For the last 30, 40, maybe longer years, we have seen a massive redistribution of wealth and income uh, from the bottom and the middle uh, to the top. We have great inequality of income and wealth uh, than we have had uh, in half a century, if not longer. Uh, on top of that, the last few years have really been a kind of horrible icing on an already troublesome cake. Namely, we had the, the failure of this society to be able to anticipate or cope with COVID. We had an economic crash in 2020 and early 2021, uh, second only to the Great Depression of the 1930s. We've now had an, a horrible inflation, 9%, 8.5%, 9% over the last year, and we're contemplating a recession to try to cope with the inflation. These are all body blows to the average American population. Well, if you put together 30, 40 years of redistribution at the expense of the majority, and then all of these calamities of the last few years with no end in yeah, you're gonna have extreme social stresses. You know, the Europeans are talking about anxiety about social explosions in Britain, uh, in France, in Germany, because they can't heat their homes because they haven't got enough energy to run their economy. I mean, we are seeing every a growing strain and stress. if I had to summarize it, it's a decline of Western capitalism. We have a competitor, China, and they are on the rise. And that is causing difficulties for this country on top of those that it already had. And yeah, that can polarize. It is already doing it. And that, at the end of that, yeah, it could be a civil war. I mean, you have to have that in your mind precisely because of the historical premise that sometimes went that way. So uh, you mentioned, I find that absolutely fascinating. Fascinating. I, um, when I was writing my, this, I've got a book coming out on neoliberal, and and when I was writing it, I came across this speech that Bill Clinton gave in 1993. Um, uh, uh, or no, actually, I'm sorry, it was George W. Bush in 2001. It was the year that George W. Bush uh, was lobbying the World Trade Organization, and at that time, the uh, entire GDP in 2001 of China was uh, one trillion dollars about the same as Texas, about a third of California. And he got them into the WTO, and within three years, they were up to four or five trillion dollars. Of course, they're now 
so, you know, this year or next year, they're going to surpass the United States at around $20 trillion. And, and in this speech, George W. Bush said, we are not only going to establish trade relations with China, we're not just exporting goods to China, we are exporting democracy to China. Because as China becomes, uh, you know, a more interlocked American economy, Economy, they will adopt more democratic measures. Now, it turns out that was obviously completely wrong, and China used all that money to build a police state. But, uh, you know, I had Stephen Moore on this program years ago, you know, the economic advisor to Trump, and I, and I said, what's more important, capitalism or democracy? And he was like, oh, capitalism, of course. You can't have democracy without it. And so could you speak, you know, how the Chinese have been able to use capitalism, or their version of it, to build a powerful machine, uh, you know, of the of a repressive state that has completely abandoned, uh, by and large, democracy. In fact, they're crushing it in Hong Kong and and threatening uh, Taiwan as we speak. Yeah, I think Americans have had a very glib tendency to assume that there's some kind of natural, necessary affinity between the capitalist economic arrangement and what we call democracy in politics. Uh, for a while, they went together here in the United States. But I don't think that was ever a very deep uh, or very lasting relationship. And the reason for that is really hard for Americans, but you have to see it. When you go into an American enterprise, we have the production of goods and services upon which we depend in enterprises, factories, stores in them a tiny group of people the owner the board of directors of its corporation make all the key decisions decide what is to be used how technology everything and they take the lion's share of the product which is why we have inequality it is not a democratic institution to build a political democracy on top of an economic system that is so undemocratic is, and I'm going to be polite now, a major undertaking fraught with difficulty. What happened in China is a kind of recognition of what I just said. And so what they did, unlike in the, in the United States, they don't pretend they have a sector that's private capitalist, just like ours, a very big one now, and they have a sector. Both operated in these undemocratic economics that is a small group of people, private uh, people elected by boards of uh, by shareholders in the private case, government officials in the public case. They have this mixed system organized and controlled by a communist party. That recipe for capitalism produces economic growth that the United States has harder and harder time coping with. It doesn't produce democracy because that capitalist way of organizing production, whether private or state, doesn't necessarily produce it. And in the case of China, as you rightly point out, they, they really do. They may some future point decide they want to go in a democratic direction, who knows? But for the time being, no. And the irony of the United States is, as we fall behind the Chinese, as their empire is rising and ours declining, as a 150 years ago it was the way between the United States and Great Britain, uh, the tendency here is going to be to forsake the democracy more and more to try to hold on to the endangered capitalism that is really facing a rough future. Now, on the other end of the spectrum, you've got the Northern European countries and the Scandinavian countries that profess capitalism, and yet you have, in some cases, 90% unionization or, you know, uh, uh, wage laws and whatnot that are so effective that you know, in some cases, the unions are not necessarily necessary. But in Germany, their constitution, this is Harry Truman's suggestion that they picked up. Uh, the constitution of Germany says that every company with over a thousand employees, 50% of their board of directors has to be made of members of organized labor, you know, from that company, employees of that company. So on the other hand, it, it appears that you can have a highly functioning democracy 
and at least a modified or heavily regulated capitalist system, or whatever you want to call it, I mean, you know, they call it social democracy, that does produce GDP growth and enhances democracy. Is, is that the case? I mean, is, are, is, there, is, is from China to Denmark the spectrum? Well, I think the Europeans, to be fair to them, they wanted to do what you said. They honestly wanted to do, they had strong political support for a kind of social democracy that took the democracy further by regulating and limiting uh, the capital. And that, that produced a remarkable society that progressive thinking people have been looking at for decades. However, it was protected because it didn't have to spend money on defense because of the U.S. domination of the world over this last period of social democracy in those countries, saving them a ton of money, and they kind of operated under the general umbrella of the United States. The United States is not able to do that anymore. And the, the difficulties and the limits of capitalism are intruding themselves in France, in Germany, in Sweden, in Finland. Here's a symptom. The Germans at first didn't want to be part of that Ukraine story. Now they're gung-ho. NATO, which for years kept at a distance by Finland and Sweden, for example, now is embraced and they are raising it. This is a sign that they're raising that also being forced to choose and they're giving up various things they did to hold on to as much of that social democracy as, as they had, but you're going to see it's less. less. It's a socialist government that is actually doing these things and that tells you that they're going to be giving up on the social democracy more than on the capitalism as long as they can. Ouch. Neoliberalism comes to Europe. <laughs> Professor Richard Wolf, it's always an honor talking with you. By the way, uh, uh, Richard hosts, uh, hosts the Economic Update with Richard Wolf on Free Speech TV. Richard, thank you so much. Thank you, Tom. Great talking with you.